thank you um, to Dr. Roger Garrett and his son Neil Garrett who've um, come in as this, uh, the second round of interviews for um, post ITU uh, experience or your um, chance to, to talk to us about um, what happened to you in intensive care and further on when you were discharged to the wards and then how you've been since discharged from hospital really. Um, we have a few questions and we're, if you're happy to answer them and okay. feel free to um, answer them as fully as you would like to. Uh, if at any time you need us to stop then just raise your hand or just ask for the right. camera to, to pause and we can do. Okay. Um, thank you very much for coming in today. No, it's appreciated. It's and I'm Thank really you. hopeful that what we, um, your experiences that you talked to us about today can help inform future patients and their families about the likely um, experiences they will have when they have survived intensive care and um, been discharged home. And also yeah. as a member of staff, it's really mm. enlightening um, speaking to you all and gives us some points that yeah. we're definitely going to take yeah. back and look at how we can further develop um, to help people when they do leave the unit. Well, I certainly wouldn't want, knowing that perhaps uh, a lot of patients or people who are on elective surgery and are going to come into uh, mm. IC, I wouldn't want to think that this was going to frighten them in any way because it's something that we come through. I'm living proof of the fact that uh, yeah. I've come through. Yeah. But um, it would be unfair not to say that certainly from my experience I went through some a very terrifying yeah. time yeah. then a frightening period mm -hmm. and then quite frankly I think a bizarre period um, mm -hmm. and if you like I can go into some detail of what these what these uh, experiences were yeah um, I um, remember absolutely nothing from the time that I was first had symptoms until I woke up in ICU and as you can see from my reaction now I was absolutely terrified mm. I was in the hands of terrorists mm. they had uh, I, a knife down my throat they were in telephone contact with my family we were a long, long way away from them, and they were demanding a ransom. I knew there was going to be no ransom paid. We couldn't possibly do that. And the only thing that I could do was to fight back. And so I had to pull this knife out of my throat and fight and keep on fighting. And the only way I, I would survive is if I killed the people who were around me. And as I say, that just burst on me. That yeah. came out of nowhere. Yeah. So it was a sudden emergence into a very terrifying situation. Very, very terrifying situation. I'm really yeah. sorry about that, Roger. Yeah. Really well, that happens. Mm. Thereafter, I was in and out of consciousness, and strange things happened to me. Um, my family. Uh, background is that we speak Spanish at home and there was a Spanish nurse with me and I spoke to her in Spanish mm. and she got very very angry with me and told me that I shouldn't be doing this the upshot of the argument that we had was that she was taken away and summarily dismissed I, uh, I was very concerned about this I understand from talking to my son today, actually, that I was quite pleased by the fact that she had been dismissed. Okay. I felt, Bracky, but I, re I remember nothing of that. Okay. And I was concerned for a long period of time that she had, in fact, been dismissed through no fault of her own. Um, my time in ICU is actually dominated by delirium. The reality, uh, if you like, the objective reality of what went on is very, very little. Yeah. 
So my next recollection is of one of the nurses who was sitting beside me, who apparently had been to India and had been immersed in some of the customs in India. One of the things he was particularly proud of was that he'd learned to hum, a, to produce a deep hum from deep down inside him, mm. while being able to carry out a conversation at the same time. Um, this worried me a little, but it didn't worry me quite as much as the other trick, I suppose, that he had learned, and that was to ingest his food in a rather bizarre way. So he was sat at a table beside me, and he had columna biscuits, columns of biscuit. I know it was of the texture of um, Edinburgh rock, mm, sort so of quite, soft but yet yeah, hard biscuit. Yeah. And he would put these end on, on the table, lean over, and ingest them through his nose. It's quite some trick. Yeah, and he was, he insisted on doing this beside me all the time. Uh, also while I was in the cubicle, I was aware of a young boy who was out in the, in the main ICU ward, who was on a respirator, and that people came around and waved him goodbye because he was going off to another part of the hospital. But in fact, it was impossible that I could have known about that. It was obviously my respirator that I was listening to. When I moved out into the outer ward, then things became not terrifying but frightening. I woke up or came, became conscious of at about a bed's length from the bottom of my bed, two children. They had long, dark, curly hair right down their backs. They had their backs to me. And they were looking out over a bay, out over a, a, a sea bay. And they never ever turned towards me. They just turned very, very slightly and then back again and had badges on their arms which kept lighting up. And I wanted to talk to them and find out who they were, but I knew exactly who they were. They were children who had been banished from their home city and they were now looking out over the bay at the city that they were banished from. I knew they would never go back. They're in fact characters from uh, some sort of Cretan myth. Never heard of that Cretan myth, but <laughs> that's what they were. <laughs> and in the rest of the ward, there was an exhibition of artefacts from Crete. And I found this all extremely creepy and worrying, even more so when I realised that the children were made of chocolate. Mm. They weren't real children. Mm. And probably a day later, they were there again, but, and the exhibition was there again, and two uh, consultants walked in, and they were extremely proud of themselves. They had actually got this chocolate manufacturer to produce this exhibition in the ward, and I was extremely angry with them. How on earth could you possibly have this spooky exhibition here? amongst people who are so severely ill. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to shout at them, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't make them understand. But they were very self-centered. They were particular. They were very pleased with themselves that they managed to get this chocolate company, this prestigious cho chocolate company, to produce this exhibition. Also at the bottom of my bed, there were great big boxes of chocolates in the shape of houses, probably out of some sort of um, picture from Ghent, some uh, Renaissance picture. They were beautifully constructed. And I do remember saying to my, do my daughter to take them away because I, I couldn't obviously eat because I was on nil by mouth. So there were these strange episodes and also I had uh, a neighboring uh, patient 
who I think had, he was, he was in for something rather minor, some eye operation. His uh, son was a consultant in the rest of the hospital, so he was getting preferential treatment and was lauding, lauding it over everybody, making sure that everybody attended to him. And he was conducting some sort of strange um, puzzle, crossword puzzle, but it, had, it involved having notices and things around the ward and having all the, all the staff running after him. He was phoning up the uh, newspaper with some of the uh, answers to the questions. He was demanding Hock be delivered from, uh, for his meal, for his evening meal. And I remember one of the nurses actually stood up to him and, and challenged him on this, and I was very pleased with that. So that was in, that was in ICU. Mm -hmm. When I was transferred out to the surgical ward, things started to change again, and it became much more of a soap opera type uh, experience that I had. Um, Would you say less less concerning than the vivid yes. memories of what was happening in intensive care? Yes, not not frightening anymore, okay. just bizarre. Okay. Um, I became paranoid. I thought that people hated me. They didn't want me there. Mm -hmm. That's because I was in a cottage hospital. They were very concerned with the lack of funds that they had, and I was a drain on their funds. Yeah. I was demanding far too much in terms of... But you weren't in a cottage hospital, you were still within this hospital. I was cert oh, certainly yeah. I was, yeah. but it, in my mind it was a cottage hospital. Yeah. Um, the very first uh, day that I arrived there, apparently there was some damage to my chest drains, and one of the members of staff, one of the three members of staff, that was all they had to, to run this cottage <laughs> hospital, was there sweating, stitching it up. Then through the back door came a couple of uh, ju very junior doctors, um, I think only in training, and they were very angry with him that he'd done a bad job and they would have to get people up from ICU to check all of this out. Uh, they were, as I say, it, it became a soap opera. Um, each evening something different was happening. There was a very large blue dog that one of the nurses had. She kept it out the back in the sluice area. <laughs> I never actually saw it, but I knew it was at least seven feet tall, had a very light blue coat, and barked infrequently. But it was helpful at one stage because they brought it out to confront the local um, rough sleepers who came to the back door of the cottage hospital and hammered very loudly at six o'clock every morning demanding food and they usually went away with a bowl of soup or some sandwiches that had been left over from the night before. But on one occasion they brought the dog out to challenge them as it were. And they threatened to kill it, poor thing. And it was such a soft animal that uh, it wouldn't have said boot or goose, actually. Its bark was much worse than its bite. So there was this, as I say, continuing soap opera developing. And I can remember all the detail, all the colour, exactly mm. what the mm. stone sluice looked like, the corrugated iron roof to the, to the outer, every detail I can remember. I was taken off one evening at about two o'clock in the morning for an x-ray and the two lads who were the uh, uh, porters. porters, big lads, but they were having a huge argument because one of their wives had gone to live with the other one. Mm, I can see why that would be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> And they were arguing the toss as they took me down to have my x-ray and the same when they brought me back. But the really uh, thing that concerned me was that the nurse who had accompanied me to the x-ray, she took them off, gave them a big lecture about, and told them to sort things out and then gave them a large sum of money because they were both working night shift in the hospital and then a day shift somewhere else and so they were out on their feet. Mm -hmm. 
So she gave him this money and said, sort yourselves out, use this money so you don't have to spend your time working all the time. And I became very concerned then that I hadn't paid them. Uh, and that worried me mm. for quite a long time. Mm. So, as I say, there were these strange things. There was the terrifying experience, mm. there was the frightening experience, and, and then there was the bizarre, bizarre experience that I had. And uh, again, it occupied these. I think the main thing I want to say is that although it was going on in my head, it was real. Mm, absolutely. Totally mm. real. In fact, although I remember a lot now of the so called real things that were happening, yeah. these things are the most real. Yeah. episodes that I still remember. Mm. I still go to bed at night and recall them. Yeah. And I'm now 15 months out of hospital. Mm. Mm. So I don't think one can sort of laugh it off and say, oh, no, that's just going no, on in your head. Not, no. It's absolutely real. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like for you now seeing your dad go through these things? I think mainly we, we were unaware of a lot of the things Dad was going through at the time. Um, when he was in ICU, I saw very little of Dad. Um, we decided, because my sister had a limited time here, she would spend more of her time. And actually going, um, there's a leaflet when you're going to ICU, and we'd read through it, and it yeah. said, be aware that mm -hmm. um, there could be delirium and paranoia. And uh, we knew from my grandmother uh, this can be a bit bizarre sometimes to say bizarre things, so prepared for that. Um, tell them about the ice. Mm. So, Dad had ice, he was nil by mouth for a yeah. lot, he had a little bit of ice in his mouth, yeah. and he had to have it taken out. So he gave it to me, he said, look after that, that's precious. So that, <laughs> that's okay, mm. Mm. That, that's fine, that's, uh, it is precious, water. It is precious, yeah. Um, but mostly, Dad spoke to me about very real life concerns money for mum, bank mm. accounts, things like this. So for me, that was that seemed to be the foremost the on his mind. Yeah. But for my sister and my mum, they were also talking to dad about um, these hallucinations, really. Mm. Yeah. And the auditory the, and visual hallucinations. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, and I used to use a traumatic pace anyway, mm. and he's dealing with the physical concerns. When we went to the surgical ward, you could see that Dad wasn't sleeping well and he kind of haunted and drained and it was beyond the physical illness he was going through. It was uh, these thing, uh, these night terrors that terrors, he was having yeah. that he couldn't quite articulate to us mm. because uh, I suppose at some point they sounded bad to you as well. Didn't mm. they? Yes, uh, I, and another thing is, I suppose, I don't know if I was actually saying anything to the people around me when mm. when I was going through these episodes. Obviously when I had a when I was intubated I couldn't speak. Yeah. But later on I don't know if the staff actually knew that I was going through these episodes, if there were signs, if I was actually talking. Mm. I was shouting and screaming in my head at times. Yeah. But I don't but know if there's anything coming that? out. Yeah. So mm. um, and obviously well, in both situations, ICU and on the surgical ward, there's much more concern with the physical state of the person than yeah. and with the mental Absolutely. state. Certainly, Dad mentioned the nurse to us a, a lot, almost every day. The uh, Spanish think, nurse. Though. Yeah, so as the, yeah. As the concern went from quite pleased something had happened and he put his foot down and he got something sorted out for sure. himself, to sure. concern that this person had lost their job over what he said. And we would just listen to that and, yeah, okay, yeah, well, we're sure that they'd be okay or whatever. Because we knew this couldn't be true, because it just couldn't be true. No one yeah. was ever going to be fired for that, because, you know, we've been speaking Spanish all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, no one's going to get fired without us being told no, this has happened. No, actually, yeah. But it was, it was kind of odd, because the first couple of times Dad said it, it, it kind of sounded convincing. Mm. Mm. So how did you kind of cope with those memories? How, what 
coping mechanisms have you put in place to cope with those memories, um, Roger? Yeah, I, um, well, this is one of them. Okay. Coming back yeah. and talking about yeah. it. I've been, as you know, to a couple of conferences mm -hmm. and yeah. spoken about it. Yeah. That has helped immensely. And most importantly, talking to family and friends. Mm. And I have written mm. all my experiences down as well. And that's available to you yeah. should you should you want to have it. Um, yeah, it's a kind offer. We will try and incorporate your memories and what you've written as part of this process so that people can refer to it so that they can... Yeah see that a the, I think for me and probably Becky as well sitting here the most important thing is to appreciate that what people are experiencing as it, as memories and the visual or auditory hallucinations they're having are actually so so real to them mm -hmm. they're absolutely the I strongest thing that you it. remember yes yes yeah so talk you were saying about talking to your family having a close family that helped yes friends talking to friends, those who want to hear. Mm. Not all friends want to hear, obviously. No. no. Now, I know you're concerned about what might be done yeah. if anything what could we differently do? could yeah, be what done. Could we do? I see you... Um, again, I, I know nothing about that. Uh, all I know is that I have this strange nurse yeah, sitting yeah, beside me. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> but other than that, it's what my family tell me. Yeah. Um, so I'm not the person to ask as far as that is concerned. But I think the mental side of things isn't mm. as well covered. No, There's the concern with the physical well-being of people, that's fine. And I'm thinking that perhaps somebody who I'm calling a, a professional listener might yeah. be provided. Yeah. Someone who knows that this might be going on, who can see the telltale signs and can talk to the patient about it. Um, another incident that I had, which did affect me tremendously, I um, was able, at about three weeks in, to take myself, well I couldn't take myself to the toilet, I still had yes. tubes and things hanging out of me, yeah. but I managed to say to myself, well I'm not going to call anybody in, I'm going to get up myself and clean my hands myself. That was the first time I saw myself. Now I have no scars on the front of me, they're all round the back, yeah. but the first time I looked in the mirror, I didn't see me. Mm. It was my father. Hours before he died. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. And mm. I was a shattered old man. Mm. And there was nobody with me. And I spent the rest of the day like this. And I just would have liked somebody to have been there with me. Yeah. And that was the time when I wished as well that I hadn't been saved. I became very resentful of the fact that I'd survived. Because you had changed so much. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. We were just talking about the initial first time that you saw yourself after your long stay in intensive care and how you, you had changed and you had lost weight and the first time you saw yourself and there was uh, at that time the, the first, you, when you saw yourself for the first time in the mirror mm. uh, you would have appreciated someone else being there to reassure you that yes you had lost weight but you were still the same person you are now um, so that's, that's used for a really kind of powerful thing as a simple process and it's something that I've We'll, I've taken a note of that and we will try and work out a way that we do that whereby the first time the patients do get into the bathroom and do get to see a mirror they they have someone there yes um, particularly if somebody has got uh, scars that are yeah you know yeah Absolutely. disfiguring and things like that it must yeah. be I, I assume that under those circumstances they would be somebody with them mm. but uh, mm. And nobody knew I was going to no, do this on my own. I just did it off my yeah. own back. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think this this idea that 
people are. If you have gone through the near-death experience and then come out of it again, that there is this feeling that you you don't want to go through that again. And why mm. why have I been brought back? Mm. And I'm going to have to suffer it all again. Mm. So as I say, the mental side of things perhaps could be. But I know the National Health Service is under huge pressure. Yeah. And and that what your experience is sadly is is unfortunately very very common unfortunately when people survive intensive care and I'm really devastated and sorry that that is the case well there's <laughs> but you're right the 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 professional listener or having someone mm -hmm. on the wards when you're emerging through that terrifying time is something that we need to look at mm. I mean, I, the other thing that I would say is that I was extremely fortunate. I live locally. Yeah. My family were with me every day. That's true. One or other member of yeah. my family, or both. Yeah, they were. I think you said right. before that's when you felt comfortable enough to sleep. That's right, yes. I mean, I, I, I didn't sleep at all. I mean, everybody's very concerned at the end after four weeks that I hadn't really slept properly and I didn't want to take sleeping pills because, again, I felt that I, I wouldn't wake up mm -hmm. yeah. because nil by mouth, your mouth gets dry, it has to be moistened and there wasn't going to be anybody around to moisten my mouth and I was just going to dry up. Mm -hmm. um, and so the only time I felt safe to sleep was when my wife would come in, so unfortunately she'd come to see me and, you'd go straight and to I'd sleep. nod off because mm. I felt safe. Dad always said he wasn't sleeping very well, but he was fast asleep mm -hmm. when I'd come in to see him. And that was fine. Yeah. But we just felt very bad leaving him because it's eight o'clock finish but for the visiting, visiting yeah. time. And that always felt very early. Mm. You know, I you know, would have happily stayed till ten, you know, at least seen it into the night time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, the night is, is frightening. It's frightening for you. Yeah. Very frightening. Yeah. Not Why now. is that? Because the because the lights go off, or because it gets yes. dark and quiet. Yes. And part, I mean, when the lights went off, there was still a light in the ceiling. That's right. And, and that came down. That comes on, yeah. But that came. Uh, the, the exhibition that I had in ICU oh, right, yeah. transferred upstairs. Oh crikey! And so there were these. The the chocolate dolls weren't there, but these, what turned out to be the taps. The towel dispenser, soap dispenser became parts of the exhibition and this spotlight kept moving around on them and that was there with me all night long. Very In fact I'd asked Neil to mm. put the towel over the taps mm. but it didn't help. Mm. That, that travelled with me. Well, you had a diary in intensive care. Yes. Was that something that was useful to yes. you? Yes. Um, I went back to that probably after two months. I came out in September, probably about December time, when I decided to open the diary quietly on my own and read mm. through mm. and see what people had written. And that was very interesting to, to fill in the, the gaps of memory mm. and to know what happened. Mm. Yeah. And talking about taking some of this on again, yeah. um, I recently had a bad fever okay and uh, I was very frightened that the chocolate dolls were going to come back wow. oh, see. I said to my wife mm. I can remember saying to my wife just got into bed don't let them in so they're still around yeah they're still, they're still there in your mind and in your awareness yeah yeah mm. you know, what's, what's it been like for you having dad back home and you and your family. It's brilliant having him back home. Yeah. <laughs> but he is dad now completely. Um, but it took a long time and I think the delirium has been as much of an impact on him as the physical side of things yeah. was. Yeah. Uh, and being able to talk about it, write his thoughts down, helped him physically get over things as well. It's a, it's such a big trauma to body and mind mm. that both things combined help, but yeah. it's still now, I think, the major thing that he, he will. It was a, such a frightening time, and 
and those things were so real to him, and we have no idea how real they were to him. You know, he, he, they just sound crazy and funny to us, mm. and yet you can see that they'd be just deeply, deeply frightening. Yeah, I mean, they are set down yeah, terribly, and um, there's nothing we can do. We can just assure him that you know you're safe and you're with everybody. Um, the family has now moved back from. Uh, France and so we've got extended family around and um, do you do you or your or Bertha your wife suffer from kind of anxiety and worry or kind of flashbacks of th that your your time in intensive care so kind of your time in the intensive care unit has it affected your family to the point that they're still struggling with those memories and still having flashbacks or Having anxiety or sleep di sleep disturbances because they're worried about you or can remember what happened. I, d I don't think so. Although on one occasion, my wife did wake up screaming. Did she? Oh dear. And we put it down to the fact that she'd been to London, was under pressure in London, and all the rest of it. But I, I don't really know what it was okay. that she was screaming about, and she doesn't. Yeah. Is it the, Lon the London when you came to do a no, talk no, on no. delirium? No, it's no, no, else. this is fairly recently actually, okay. yes. But she was absolutely terrified, she woke up mm. terrified. Mm. Yeah. Post discharge from intensive care, did you access any, kind of, any help in the community or any community based services? Um, did you go and see your GP and kind of to tell him about your memories or? Well, um, I, I've suffered from heart problems as a result of all of this as yeah. well, and so I've had to be going back fairly constantly to my GP. Um, I had a very interesting time with one of the senior um, uh, medics mm. in the practice, because none of them know, it was a very rare condition that I had, yeah. Yeah. so she said, oh, I know nothing about that. Right. Let's have a look and got me to undress and <laughs> talk me I talked her through the scars and all the, rest the scars of it. what the scars mean, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and so um I the medics are very good to me when I go in because they know what I've been through. Sure. Um I have spoken by telephone to the um psychologists as well yeah. and I did their test for yeah. post-traumatic stress disorder yeah. and I'm on the cusp of suffering from yeah. that but yeah. they said that you know my my sort of homemade remedies of talking and writing yeah. Yeah. are the right way to go about it but, and if it gets worse to go back to them and mm -hmm. I, I haven't gone back to them so you know I think it I think it's working but Good. as you can see it yeah. it suddenly bursts out it does mm. yeah yeah. But, um, there we are.